Order, members, and we move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment, and I call Mr. William Humphrey. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Humphrey. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. My department began its review of bus operator licensing in 2008 and has been actively engaged in developing proposals with a view to supporting a vibrant bus passenger transport sector. The consultation in 2010 showed a clear consensus that change was needed. We are currently finalising proposals for a new bus operator licensing regime to replace both the road service licence and the 10B permit with a tiered licensing regime which better meets the needs of modern bus transport and which is compliant with the, requ with the requirements of EU regulations. It is generally agreed by industry stakeholders that the current scheme, which is 47 years old, is outdated and no longer able to support the diversity of passenger transport being delivered in the 21st century. The new licensing regime will be designed to support integrated passenger transport, as well as delivering a safe, fair and fit-for-purpose licensing regime and allowing a vibrant and innovative community transport sector to continue to flourish. Policy development is ongoing, as is engagement with key stakeholders, and no final decisions have been made. Once I am content that proposals meet the objectives I have set out above, my department will consult and will welcome views of everyone involved in or availing of bus transport. Given the wide-ranging demand for change, we are seeking to develop final proposals with a view to making new primary le legislation at the earliest possible date. Further engagement is due to take place in the coming weeks, and I will be seeking to consult on proposals before summer recess. <laughs> Before calling Mr Humphrey uh, for a supplementary, could I just inform members that questions 4 and 11 have been withdrawn? Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister assure the House that the charitable transport services will be protected so as not to jeopardise vital services that are provided for the disabled and vulnerable community uh, within Northern Ireland? The services to which the member refers are vital, not just to those vulnerable people who are recipients of the service, but to Northern Irish society as a whole. Therefore, it is imperative not only that they are protected, but they are promoted, and uh, that this is made as easy as possible for them. There are changes that need to be made. The current scheme is outdated. And all stakeholders recognise the need for change. It's important, though, that any change is an improvement and that it does protect and promote the, the very sector to which the member refers. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what his department is doing to ensure that the department's current proposals are not going to have a negative impact or a detrimental impact? on community transport services in rural communities and rural areas? I thank the member for that question. Again, this is a, a very important question. Just last week, I met with representatives of community transport providers, and they outlined some concerns that they had with existing proposals. Just let me be clear that Existing proposals are not necessarily the final proposals, and I am determined that the final proposals do reflect the concerns that uh, those uh, people raised so articulately with me last week. The service provided to those in rural areas is vital. Uh, it is something that other providers have not been able to do, and it performs great work in terms of tackling social exclusion and therefore must be supported and should be supported, and any proposals should reflect the value of these partnerships to society as well, particularly those in rural communities. Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy uh, Speaker. I thank the Minister for his responses. Uh, has the Minister sought the opinion of the PSNI uh, recently as to their preferred Way forward on the consumption of alcohol on buses, aside from an, an inventing an invisibility cloak for police officers, it is clear that the current system can't work or won't work. 
I thank uh, the, the member for the, the question. It's, it's on buses, but it, it's a wee bit of a, a jump from where we were, and it, it's an issue that we addressed in question time last month. The issue of drinking on buses is one that has been a cause of consternation and indeed controversy for many years, but it came to the fore again after a recent incident at the Odyssey where a lot of young people arrived on buses and drunk. This uh, issue was out for consultation during the, the summer months and there, was, there were a lot of responses and a lot of very different and varied responses as to how we best tackle the, this issue. Uh, I do not recall off the top of my head what the PSNI's preferred approach was, but you have alluded to the difficulty that they have with the current setup where they actually physically have to catch someone in the act of consuming alcohol on the bus, which is, and I remind members, which is illegal. And unfortunately, they, they have never been able to do so because if they come onto the bus and the person drops the drink or sets it down, they just deny all, all knowledge of it, and the police haven't been able to get uh, prosecutions on that. I spoke about the difficulties that we would have in proceeding with an outright ban of alcohol or carriage of alcohol on buses and the, the anomalies that would create for someone who was maybe out shopping and bought a meal deal in Marks and Spencers with a bottle of wine, would they be able to get the bus home? So I think uh, our response to this undeniable problem has to be measured, has to be balanced and has to be realistic as well. You, and I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Prince and Deputy Speaker. And following on from Mr. McIndoff's question, um, Minister, can you give me an assurance that the community transport sector that they will not be put out of business by any change to the licensing laws? Well, as, as I said in the answer to you, Mr. McIndoff, I'd be determined that they're not put out of business. These are uh, very good operators that provide a very vital service. Indeed, the service provided by these partnerships is going to become all the more vital, one would imagine, if we look at the Department of Health and uh, transforming your care coming down the line. I believe there will be more demand for and more need for community transport. I, I think it is important whenever I am discussing community transport and how any licensing changes might impact on them, that I do not do so in isolation and actually do so in consultation with other departments like the Department of Health, like OFM, DFM around the social exclusion and indeed DSD in terms of social mobility, as well as DARD when we are talking about uh, people living in rural areas. So, like I say, these are people and partnerships who are doing a great job and they are doing it very well. So, therefore, I think to bring forward any new regulations that would make life more difficult for them rather than easier would be pretty foolish. Uh, could I just draw attention to members? There is a lot of background noise, and, and we have to be able to hear both the questions and the answers. I call Mr. David McElveen. Uh, question two, please, Deputy Speaker. My department is supporting the development of community planning in a number of ways and a programme of targeted capacity building for elected representatives, local government officers, and transferring officials from central government is being put in place. Last year, the Department launched the Community Planning Foundation Programme to guide and help prepare councils for community planning. It is non-statutory guidance containing key building blocks that councils can put in place before they receive the statutory duty in April 2015. A subsequent engagement event in December 2013 was designed to help further delegate the understanding of the Council's new duty of community planning and the content of the Foundation Programme. I have asked community places to provide tailored support to councils as the next stage of that support. This organisation will use its community planning toolkit, its expertise and its in-depth knowledge of the community and voluntary sector to assist councils take forward elements of the Foundation Programme. Its support during this initial planning stage will greatly help councils develop and refine their practical working arrangements and assist them build new relationships with key stakeholders in the new council area. 
My officials are also putting in place a programme of work with other departments and their arm's length bodies to help prepare them for the changed relationship between central and local government. An interdepartmental group has been formed to raise awareness and consider what the introduction of community planning will mean for them. The Department will also be monitoring the implementation of the Foundation programme during this period. An implementation monitoring group is being set up to do this, and feedback will assist with the identification of community planning partners, formulating statutory guidance, and identifying further capacity building measures. Thank you, Mr. Michael Veen, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very detailed answer um, on this matter. I'm sure when he was giving his answer, at the very front of his mind um, was the undoubted success of the community cluster concept in the Ballymena Borough Council area. Um, I wonder, when the Minister's answer, he had mentioned about tailored support. Um, I wonder, does tailored support, would that in include financial support for councils that wish to develop very successful con concepts which are perhaps already working? Well, the tailored support that is being provided in terms of guidance and expertise through community places is being financed by the executive. Therefore, no cost will be incurred by council for this planning or for the receipt of this community planning toolkit. However, should a council, an STC or a new council in shadow form, or indeed when they have power conferred onto them on the 1st of April 2015, decide that they would require further training in any area, I'd be very supportive and uh, do my best to ensure that they get it. I won't say that it would be at no cost to the Council, but I think it's important that we encourage I suppose, continuous professional development of councillors and councils. It's very important to emphasise that this capacity building should, won't stop on April the 1st, 2015. Councils will see what areas that they do need further training in, that they need further capacity building in. I think it's vitally important that we do everything we can, not just to increase the competence of uh, councillors and the new councils, but that also the confidence of councillors and in councillors on the new councils as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill Boyle. But could I ask the Minister, how does he ensure that the statutory agencies will work with the community and voluntary sector to develop a proper community plan? Gormil Magad. Gormil Magad, Fahonia and Kesh Samuel Shin. I thank the member for that interesting question. It's vitally important that statutory agencies and government departments buy in or are made to buy in to uh, community planning. I think most members here, if not all, will have seen other projects and schemes fail, in my opinion, due to a failure or reluctance of certain, if not all, departments to participate to, to the full. The bodies to be specified in subordinate legislation as community planning partners of a council will be those statutory agencies that deliver public services in the council's district. It's important that these bodies are specified to ensure as much as possible the coordination of the delivery of those services. A short list of potential statutory partners is currently being drafted, but this is still at an early stage. In the coming months, my department will be engaging with relevant stakeholders to ensure that all views are considered. But it should be noted that the partners specified in the legislation will be those that all new councils will use, but then it will be a matter for each individual council to decide if it wishes other non-statutory bodies to be considered as their community planning partners. Dominic Bradley. Boy Lumsa Ifri Danara Kate Avas Aran Trianal Augusaran Togal Aquina a Togu the Cruise Group in the Gorli Mor Alwakan Dak Horu and Real Disatual Kadisha. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for his assessment to date of the training and capacity building which the Council cluster groups have received in preparation for the reform of local government. 
Thanks. Uh, I thank the, the member for that question. I spoke in response to the original question about the importance of capacity building and training, not just for elected members but also for local government staff and indeed staff transferring from central to local government as part of local government reform. And there is a capacity building programme being rolled out. This is wide ranging and far reaching and covers hugely important areas of work such as community planning which we have been discussing and then planning itself as a function which seems to be one that is causing a lot of consternation among uh, councillors as I travel around the, the various statutory transition committees to see how they are progressing through this process. Uh, work is ongoing between planning officers and the STCs already in development of their own local development plans. And importantly, there is a lot of work to be done in training uh, councillors to be ready to take on the power of planning. I know as a former councillor that a few years ago a lot of councillors were excited at the prospect of getting responsibility for planning, but I think now as the reality <laughs> becomes closer, there, there appears to be a degree of nervousness as they realise the actual responsibilities that, that go with it. Uh, there will be a lot of planning training done and actually some mock planning committee meetings done with planning officers to get councillors a good grasp of exactly what this decision making will mean for them. I'll call Mr. Robin Swan. Question number three. Dunluce Castle is one of Northern Ireland's premier tourist attractions, but the decline in visitor numbers over the last few years does not reflect its true historic and economic potential. That is why the Northern Ireland Environment Agency has already undertaken substantive steps towards addressing this issue. NIEA has established an innovation trial to create a world-class visitor experience that does justice to these iconic ruins and brings economic benefits to the region. The agency is already working with the Northern Ireland Tourist Board, which has identified Dunluce as a key site on the Causeway Coastal Route. Together, they are taking a more innovative approach to visitor engagement to ensure that the new experience at Dunluce is enjoyed by all ages and through all seasons. Creating this readily accessible must-see destination will involve new site infrastructure, a wide variety of exhibitions and live events, and the provision of breathtaking viewing platforms. The agency has been successful in securing over £300,000 support from the Heritage Lottery Fund towards an exciting proposal to uncover the lost town of Dunluce. The remains of this early 17th century plantation town lie in the fields outside the castle gate. Work is already underway to reveal these remains so that visitors can once again walk down the original 17th century cobbled street. Key to the future success of Dunluce Castle will be elevating it to a world-class visitor facility. That means taking a strategic approach to the site's development. That is why NIEA is leading the transformation of the Dunluce Castle experience. By working closely with partners and stakeholders, NIEA is not just protecting our heritage, but strengthening our economy by presenting Dunluce as part of Northern Ireland's living history. Thank you, Mr. Swan, for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I thank the, the Minister for his answer, although I'm not sure if he actually believes it or not, because I think he was struggling actually reading that out. Uh, Dunluce Castle, as he rightly says, is a, a major tourist attraction. 81,000 visitors in 2010, 44,000 visitors in 2013, a drop of 37,000 visitors in three years. The NIEA is not managing this site well. Your predecessor and the Deputy Minister opened a new tourist facility worth 200,000 in 2011. Question, so I hope you're going to spend this money wisely. And the Minister has said he's going to undertake a written branch review of the NIEA recently on radio. Is this management of doing this one of these? I uh, thank the, the, the member for the, the supplementary statement. Sorry, question. 
<laughs> there has undoubtedly and undeniably been a huge decrease in visitor numbers to Dunluce over the past five years. And you, well, you heard me on the radio speaking about NIEA, so you will know, as will other members, that I don't defend something if I don't think it's, it's defensible. In this case, however, I do not believe that it's solely or even largely down to the management. I don't think that that's attributable to, to or the decline in numbers is attributable to that. We have to look at what else has happened during this period. You know, there's a, a couple of significant competing visitor attractions of Oakmont, such as Titanic Belfast and the Giants Causeway Centre, which, in combination with periods of very poor weather and the recession, have impacted on visitor numbers. NIEA is currently analysing the reasons for fallen visitor numbers to inform the future strategic development of the castle experience. But I am conducting a review of the agency. I do not think it is the agency's fault that, that these numbers are down. However, I think the agency, in partnership with others, has a key role to play in ensuring that we bring numbers back up. It is vital that this £300,000 is spent wisely. And I look forward to input from Mr. Swan, from all stakeholders, as to how they envisage a, a world-class visitor attraction would look like on that site. I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. I got free to ask and call you. And can I thank the minister for his, uh, his, uh, his question or his answer so far? But could the minister provide an update on the application by the private, private land, uh, the landowner for the site? And what discussions have you had with all our ministers to try and promote and attract visitors to the site? And could I suggest the minister maybe would use in these promotions of that site there the, the, the gateway through the Glens of Antrim? That might bring more people in because if you don't promote the Glens of Antrim, you're not going to get any more going around the coast to Dunluce. Where am I? Uh, I thank the member for the questions. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the, the first one first. The application by a neighbouring landowner is currently being reviewed by, by the planning service. I have already met with the applicant uh, just the, over the last couple of weeks to discuss his application, and my colleague Alex Atwood, in his role uh, as minister, I think had several meetings with the applicant. This is a particularly sensitive landscape, designated as both an area of outstanding natural beauty and an area of significant archaeological interest. Therefore, it is important that any new facilities which may be provided in this area are appropriate to their setting. I think it is important, and I did outline it in my first answer to Mr Swan, that we do look not just at Dunluce in isolation, but as, it, as the Causeway Coast in its entirety, and the Glens, of course, as a package. But I have no doubt that Dunluce can be the jewel in this crown. If you, if you don't mind references to the crown, <laughs> and uh, I think we have to do ev everything, <laughs> ev everything, everything we can to maximise the benefit of Dunluce and the benefits that it can bring to the wider community and the Glens area. I call Mr. Jim Allister. <laughs> The minister has no explanation for the fall in numbers. Does he think that the pricing policy might have something to do with it? Well, entry fees at Dunluce Castle currently compare favourably with other sites in the region. For example, Dunluce Castle currently charges £5 for full adult entry compared to £8.50 at the Giants Causeway and £5.60 at Carrica Reed Rope Bridge, but included in that rate are guided tours, audiovisual handsets available in seven languages in adult and child formats, and a site guide leaflet. I consider this to be good va value for money and have no plans to reduce this charge at present. I think one of the issues is the access that people can get without paying the charge. And, uh, People are able to avail of the fantastic views without actually paying to go in to the facility. That's something that we will be looking at when, as part of the master plan for a new facility there. It's important that we maximise re revenue generated by this wonderful facility. 
could I ask uh, the Minister, uh, first of all, and I'm sure he will accept this, that uh, <clears throat> some of the handling of this project at elements of the Department up until a few months back uh, left quite a bit to be desired. However, looking ahead to uh, opportunities and the potentials that could arise for funding around the place, could I seek assurances from the Minister, first of all, that every effort will be made from now onwards to work closely in collaboration with A, the landowner, B, the trust, and to avail of and to help draw down funding opportunities that may exist departmentally, other departments, and indeed from other sources of funding, including the lottery. I thank the member for the question. I can assure the member that there has been a stakeholder group established that consists of NIEA naturally, the neighbouring landowners and other agencies such as the Tourist Board with an interest in the development of this site. I call Ms Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. The Taxis Act, Northern Ireland 2008, which was passed by this Assembly without division, was designed to deliver the benefits which enhanced taxi regulation could bring to Northern Ireland, including an increased choice for consumers, greater clarity for all around what taxis are permitted to do, and an increased capacity within the industry to deal with peak demand at specific times and locations, thereby helping to address public and personal safety concerns. Since September 2013, progress has been made on a number of fronts, including gaining Environment Committee approval for the SL1 for taxi driver testing and periodic training. A consultation issued on 7 February on a proposed new wheelchair accessible vehicle specification, which has been the subject of research commissioned by my department. This consultation finishes on 4 April 2014. Operational work to implement the regulations pertaining to the remaining reforms in September 2014 remains challenging but achievable, with steady progress being made on all streams of work. I am aware that some members have expressed reservations about the implementation of single-tier licensing, something the Department have been working towards for some time and which is supported by a wide range of stakeholders. I have listened carefully to the members' concerns and am considering what if any, changes might be appropriate to the plans which have been approved by the Environment Committee and could address those concerns whilst still delivering the benefits flowing from the Act. Thank you, and I, I thank the Minister for his answer, although I was hoping for a little bit more information on the progress that was being made in all streams of work. Um, there's been a suggestion that um, a three-mile exclusion zone around Belfast should be put in place. Does the Minister believe that this would meet the objectives of the Bill, i.e. allowing increased choice for customers, <coughs> increased capacity and peak demand, and therefore for addressing public safety concerns? I am aware of the proposal or suggestion that the, the, the member has alluded to. However, I am not aware that it would do any of the, the things that, that, that she alluded to. The rationale behind the bill, and as outlined in my original answer, was about reducing confusion, increasing public safety, clarifying what taxis can do and where. Currently, there is a degree of confusion out there, and there is certainly confusion for tourists and visitors uh, to the city. I remain unconvinced that the establishment of a, a three-mile or, or five-mile or two-mile radius with Belfast-specific plates operating inside of that would uh, meet the, the objectives of this, this bill. Uh, however, as I have said, I remain open to suggestions. I'm looking at what I can do with the bill that will satisfy those uh, that are concerned with it without compromising the essence of the bill. Thank you. And that ends the period for oral questions.
Uh, we now move on to topical questions. And as Ms. Karen McEvitt is not in her place, I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister to provide details behind his announcement today that he has given planning permission for a £12 million transformation of the iconic Scottish Mutual Building in Belfast City Centre? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for his question. Yes, uh, today I have recommended planning approval to Belfast City Council. The ultimate decision will, will, will rest with them, and I'm, I'm hopeful that they will agree with me that this £12 million conversion that will transform the iconic Scottish Mutual Building in Belfast will, meet, or will be met with approval by them also. Listed building consent has also been improved to sympathetically convert the Grade B1 listed building into a boutique hotel opposite the City Hall. This prominent listed building in Donegal Square is within the Linen Conservation Area, meaning that it is within an area that played an important role when Belfast was the established linen capital of the world. The building is over 100 years old, dating back to 1904. Currently, it is partially occupied. Plans retain all of the original features. There will be two bars and two restaurants on the ground and first floors, and 40 hotel bedrooms and 10 service departments on the upper three floors. Thank you. Mr. McKinney for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his reply? For his reply. I understand this application was determined within uh, six months, and I congratulate the Minister on making the right decision and making it quickly. Does he share my view that this significant investment will give a tremendous boost to the local economy and the tourism product that Belfast has to offer? Well, I certainly believe that this is welcome news for Belfast City Centre. This significant investment demonstrates a confidence in the local economy and will boost tourism by enhancing the choice for tourists, business, travellers and local people. Due to its economic significance, this proposal was designated a large-scale investment project and both the planning application and listed building consent were determined within six months, as the, as the member pointed out. It is also important I think, to point out that this will bring jobs. There will be construction jobs in the, in the short term and full and part-time jobs when this hotel is up and running. I call Mr Raymond McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in light of the spotlight programme around the, the waste disposal on the Moybury Road, and the recent decision by Derry City Council to call for a further and more comprehensive inquiry, you know, adding to the, the Mills report, would the Minister uh, outline how he feels it can be advanced? Thank the member for the question. Uh, the Spotlight programme was widely viewed, and I think all members will agree it made for quite sombre viewing threw up a lot of questions, and fortunately, I believe we are in a position where a lot of these questions have been answered, and a lot more will be answered in, in the near future. On the 5th of June last year, my predecessor commissioned Chris Mills to conduct an independent review into illegal dumping at the Maboy Road landfill site. I released the Mills report on the 18th of December last year, just a couple of days after getting it and having time to go through it myself. And pretty soon, I will be issuing my response to the report's recommendations. I'm actually meeting Chris Mills at four o'clock this afternoon to go through it with him. But this response will set out comprehensive actions to tackle waste crime and strengthen waste regulation in Northern Ireland. With regards to the specifics of the Spotlight Programme and the case at Maboy Road, I must also point out that there was this independent review, but there's also an ongoing criminal investigation, which will go some way to, I hope, to addressing the concerns raised by members, and indeed the concerns raised by, by members of the public, and rightly so. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for 
uh, both that question and indeed his work on this issue. But uh, though given that the, the Mills report and even the PSNI investigation is very much site specific, do, would the Minister agree that without a further and perhaps more comprehensive inquiry, there will always be the unanswered question are there other illegal dumps in the North West? Well, I think uh, it's fair to say I thank the, the member for the supplementary. We have already identified other illegal dumps across the North. Currently, after Operation Sycamore, which was the investigation into Mabwai Road, uh, the department launched Operation Toothfish. I don't know who thinks up the names, but it is currently investigating waste crime at 33 sites across the north, and regrettably, some of them are in the northwest as well. Uh, I think it's important, and I have said this before in the House, that my department and NIEA work closely with other departments and with the PSNI on this issue. I've met with the Minister for Justice on this. I think it's vitally important that the severity of sentences reflects the seriousness of the crime. And here we are talking about serious crime. It's, it's hardly victimless, and the outcome of it is a cost to the ratepayer. It's my ambition and hope that we can make the polluter pay for the cleanup of this site and every site that we find. However, in the absence of being able to do so, in the absence of being able to bring the perpetrators to justice, it will be left to the ratepayer and taxpayer to, to foot the bill. And that's, that should be reflected in the severity of sentences that are, are there for this type of crime. Well, Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal. De Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister what action is being taken to overcome the obstacles on the implications of mutual recognition of penalty points? I thank the, the member for her question. The mutual recognition of penalty points is a very important piece of work that both my predecessor and now, now myself have been engaged with our counterparts in the Irish Republic on for some time. It's something that there is certainly a political will there to see, I believe, and it's something that will greatly increase road safety on this island. There have been difficulties, technical difficulties, with re regard to the progressing of this <coughs> issue. It's, it's something I'd be happy to discuss with the member in private, but I don't really want to broadcast the difficulties because then they might be exploited by people who, who, who would avail of, of loopholes and might use them to, to get out of taking penalty points in either or both jurisdictions. Ms. Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And I do understand that this is going to be quite an unpopular uh, subject to even discuss, but I take it from your response that you would agree that this needs to be implemented sooner rather than later. Oh, it, 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 it certainly does, but it, it's, it's worth pointing out you know, that this is actually groundbreaking, and the work that has been done between ourselves that, and the government and the Irish Republic in terms of road safety already. We have already we recognise disqualification in, in both jurisdictions, and this is the next logical step in that. Like I said, the political will certainly exists, and it certainly exists in Dublin as well. There, there, there's a, a degree of frustration at this, and the frustration is aimed largely at the judiciary at the moment. I think it's, it's, it's vital that we do work to get over this. And uh, I give the member my assurance that, that I will. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the minister what action is he taken, has he taken, uh, following uh, a number of media reports about uh, uh, terrorist shrines that were located across Northern Ireland, and many of which were on property belonging to his department? I thank the member for the question. However, I have to plead ignorance as to which shrines were on land belonging to my department. I know since taking office, I had heard uh, reports of, of one such shrine, as he puts it, and upon investigation by my department, it was established that the land on which the, the, 
the monument was was belonging to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. We had then asked them to submit a planning application as there was no planning permission for it. And I give the member my assurance that I will, upon leaving the chamber this afternoon, see where that is. Newton for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Given the equality uh, situation, then, can I ask the Minister what action he has taken about the naming of a playground uh, after a, a terrorist? <laughs> Question seven. Is I, uh, I thank uh, the, 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 member, the member for his question. That's one for, for which an, an answer for which I prepared earlier. I should explain that in this matter, district councils are independent of central government and are accountable to their local electorate and ratepayers. They are also directly answerable to the Equality Commission in respect of their Section 75 duties. Under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, all designated public authorities, including district councils, when carrying out their functions, must have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity between certain specified individuals and groups, and should encourage and promote good relations within those sectors, regardless of their religious or political persuasion. I follow in the conclusion, or well, sorry, the Equality Commission has advised that presently its consideration of the matter to which the member refers is not yet complete. A draft report has been sent to the Newry and Moran District Council for its comments, and the Commission will then consider those points before finalising its investigation. Call Mr. Loris Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the Minister if uh, could he explain the reasons for the continued delay in the publication of BMAP, particularly uh, given that it has received a certificate of uh, general conformity from the Department of Regional Development? thank the member for the question. BMAP was, as the member has pointed out, certified as being in general conformity with the Regional Development Strategy 2035 in October last year. The adoption and publication of a development plan can only be done once the Department is satisfied that all the necessary and procedural requirements have been completed. These requirements related to an equality impact assessment and a habitats regulations assessment. I can confirm that these requirements were met before Christmas, and I then ask the Executive Committee to consider the matter. Subject to the agreement of my ministerial colleagues, I will instruct my department by order under Article 8 of the Planning ANI Order 1991 to adopt and make operational the plan at which time it can be made publicly available. There is now no statutory impediment to adoption of BMAP by my department. I can't, however, be definitive on the time scale at present, given the ongoing discussion with executive colleagues. Call Mr. Loris Kelly for supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I take it from uh, the Minister's reply that the hold-up uh, is a matter for OFM, DFM, and not tabling it before the executive. And therefore, has the Minister conducted any analysis of uh, th this? failure on the economic uh, restrictions that it has placed on the development of Belfast and also on those that are waiting uh, for a, a, a decent home and a house, particularly in the round uh, North Belfast, given the, the failure to designate uh, uh, the area for housing? Well, the importance of adopting BMAP is the certainty it provides for developers, decision makers and the public. On a daily basis, my department receives letters as to why the plan has not yet been adopted, not least from members of the construction industry expressing grave concerns over the continued delay in the adoption of BMAP. Many house builders see the adoption of, of the document as critical to the recovery in their sector. Additions to the workforce can only be sustained by continuous supply of planning approvals. The adopted plan will confirm this supply. A substantial number within the business community, including house builders, have participated in the plan process since its initiation. And it's no exaggeration to say that millions of pounds have been invested by those participating in the public inquiry for BMAP in order to secure zoning of land for housing and employment. Whilst the release by my predecessor of the PAC reports has provided some assurance to landowners, many householders who have been supported by their banks 
through the most severe recession and living memory are now under severe pressure from those banks to deliver on these sites to recover the significant sums that they have been given. Well done. Order. The time is up. Thank you, Minister.